We're back from RustConf, and it's time to catch up on another week in Bevy. A Bevy meetup happened in person at RustConf, featuring Tiny Glade demos and a Q&A session from Alice. There was also a Bevy-related talk, Shooting Stars, Live Code a Game in 30 Minutes, presented at the conference. The videos from the conference will go out sometime in the future, but we don't yet know when that will be. The community also responded to Bevy's fourth birthday post this week. The posts were collected in the community reflection on Bevy's fourth year post on the Bevy blog, including Alice's dream job post and more from the community. And alongside some other PRs, asset documentation is getting a boost, including in 15057 for asset mode. And with that newfound clarity, some changes are being made as well. In 15090, the load and save asset processor was deprecated and replaced with load transform and save, with identity asset transformer being a nice tag along. The asset transformation pipelines are one of the lesser known features of Bevy, so it's really nice to see them getting some additional documentation, and I hope we can forge more shared understanding in the future. Moving on to aspect ratios, 15091 improves aspect ratio with a few new constants. That's 16.9, 4 thirds, and ultra wide. These represent common aspect ratios, as you might want to use them, and we also get some additional great error messages. Aspect ratio is used under the hood for various image and projection use cases and can also be used standalone. In 15.095, 2D rendering and UI rendering get a little bit closer together as UI image gets a rect field, allowing the selection of areas of an image. There's a full demo in the PR for this one, which you can see right here at the bottom for different image selections and applications of image slices and texture atlases. Similarly, 15.120 adds to the UI material example by drawing a border in a UI material using the UV coordinates in a fragment shader. And in 15.085, we get state scoped events that will automatically be cleared when exiting a state. This is useful when you want to guarantee clean state transitions. And while currently you add event types with add event to your app, this adds a new add state scoped event, which is what will cause events to be automatically cleared when exiting a state. And in 15.066, we get a new observer function on the trigger type. This trigger type is the type that is required to be the first argument in an observer. And the observer function on the trigger type returns the entity observing the triggered event, which in turn would allow an observer to delete itself. If you're unfamiliar with observers, it's useful for this explanation to know that observers are typically components on their own entity. So while you can trigger for particular entities or targets, the entity the observer component is actually on is usually a different entity. This field returns that different entity, which is what would allow you to remove the observer inside of the observer handler. And next up, we'll talk a little bit about projections and fixing a nice paper cut. The orthographic projection default values have been oriented around 3D for a while now, with the 2D defaults being set by the camera 2D bundle instead. This has caused the 2D users to need to redefine the near and far clipping plane values when setting other fields like orthographic projection scale. This has been a paper cut for a while because there are no good near and far clipping plane values that work for 2D and 3D at the same time. So in 15.073, the default value is split into a default 2D and a default 3D. This makes it easier to use the correct near and far clipping plane values when overriding other fields on the orthographic projection, especially when using 2D. Speaking of projections, there's a new projection zoom example showing off orthographic and perspective zooms. And the orbiting example now lives in a separate example called camera orbit. In 13127, new methods were described for fetching components focusing on a specific ergonomic approach, which would be accessing components related to an entity more directly. So more work would need to be done on the mutable variants of these functions. So 15089 implements read-only access in this way on entity ref. If you're interested in what this looks like, be sure to check out the actual tests that were written inside of the PR as this shows off the new get components function and the query for components, which would access those components on said entity. And wrapping up our PR overview, we've got more triangles and vertices per meshlet in 15.023, where meshlets gain an increase in the maximum vertices and triangles from 64 to 64 right now to 255 vertices and 128 triangles. This results in a greater percentage of triangles with a maximum triangle count when building meshlets. As usual, the PR has great descriptions of what trade-offs are being made, as well as additional details. So if you're trying to follow the meshlets work, definitely go give this PR a read. 
And of course, as always, Alice's Merge Train is a maintainer level view into active PRs, both those that are merging and those that need work. And she always does a great job with this. So if you're interested from just the general maintainer side of things, or if you're interested in PRs that are actually in the process of getting merged, this is always a great thread to read. And with that, we'll kick off the showcases this time with sand simulation that we saw last week, but this time with water. And next up, we've got a HUD in Blendvi, or in Blender at least. This is in progress work on a HUD using Blender and Blendvi to set up the materials. This gives it this nice pre-rendered look, even though it is in fact set up with models and components inside of Blender using the Blendvi package. In our next showcase, we've got orbit tessellation and a new gas giant and ring shader. This uses gizmos to visualize the segments of the orbits and the red lines to visualize the viewport. And from space back down to earth with Project Harmonia, which added the ability to edit and remove previously spawned walls, along with an undo and redo system. The undo redo system implementation is linked to in the Discord thread. And Rusty Lander is a work in progress lander style game with a main menu, gameplay, and a game over screen if you happen to run into one of these little platforms. And we've got a number of planets in the showcases this week. Here's one which is a generated planet with an atmosphere. A couple months of work went into this demo, which has some interesting terminal based rendering and the ability to make files that become entities. It also can take advantage of Lua and Yarn Spinner for dialogue. This tower defense game just gained in an objectives panel, which is built with vanilla Bevy UI. And many people are still experimenting outside of Bevy UI with different layers on top, including this one, which is a hot loadable HTML like templating on top of Bevy UI. It doesn't include any widgets, just the tools to build them. And next up, more UI. This is a work in progress style and animations crate that enables applying styles directly to standard Bevy UI nodes using CSS. And we've seen this before in This Week in Bevy, but this is Bevy Terrain Test, which is a terrain deformation with splines and shapes demo. And it's always good to eat the frog, so to speak. So this is an early problem solving for a future Bevy app involving four viewports and Bevy Panorbit camera for the orbiting. Next up, this three layer health bar is three separate bars stacked on top of each other to make up the background and two bar layers. The frontmost layer responds instantly while the second layer eases in with a quadratic easing. And this is a screenshot from Cosmos, a multiplayer block-based space exploration game in active development. In this case, we've got a planet that happened to spawn in front of a star. The skybox here was enabled by something called Spacescape, which I've never used myself, but I've linked to on the website. And To Build a Home is a game we've seen before. This is a new UI for the inventory for transitioning between, you know, different chests, the player, and just the ground in general. And here we have some RPG world generation, which is described as performant deterministic infinite world generation for this RPG game. And I didn't really ever think I'd see Typist as a interactive demo, but this is Velist, which is a Bevy Typist Velo UI demo, which is a work in progress crate that combines Bevy with Typist and Velo. And this video shows off a number of demos from a 2D physics sandbox. This physics sandbox has Lua scripting, custom tools, and even a package system for the distribution of third-party scripts, tools, etc. A demo of what the Lua scripting looks like is also included in the Discord thread. And some of these demos are just really impressive. And this is more Radiance Cascades, which is a technology I just really enjoy reading about. This is a demo of Bevy Radiance Cascades, which is a crate combined with Bevy Motion GFX. And fractals are always very cool. This is a zooming fractal application with arbitrary precision and resolution. The author notes that it didn't need to be built in Bevy, but building it in Bevy did make it easier. And next up, we've got large scale destruction of planets using user driven choices. Following the decimation of the planet, a car drives around on top of the planet and can fall off into the gaps that were created. The car is just a placeholder asset, so look for that to be a little bit more science-y in the future. More updates were posted for this one later in the week, including this wonderful looking image. And this was originally a Marching Cubes demo that shifted to a new surface nets based approach using fast surface nets RS. Surface nets are an algorithm for extracting an ISO surface mesh from a sign distance field sampled on a regular grid. Next up, the water shader in this roller coaster tycoon style game got an overhaul. And I kind of just really like this as a scene, including just watching the uh, Ferris wheel here go around in a circle. 
And next up, we've got a demo for Morningstar, which is a fast dynamic fracture using position-based rod bonded discrete methods. Links to the relevant PDFs for the words that I just strung in a sentence are available in the GitHub repo. And that GitHub repo is entropy lost slash Morningstar. Inspired by an old mobile game called Dungeon Raid, this game provides a twist in that path selection mechanics. This is still in the proof of concept stage, but it already looks like it could be pretty fun. And after a few months of work, this 3D platformer was born. It's a timed run, so get jumping and don't fall into the lava. And from 3D to 2D, this is a short demo with underground lighting. The author states, Bevy really is such a joy to work with. And finally, in our showcases, we've got Untold Dawn. After several months of hard work, Untold Dawn is getting ready to open for pre-alpha this October 5th. Untold Dawn is a next-generation role-play intensive multi-user dungeon game developed in Rust using Bevy as its engine, as you might imagine. MUDs are multiplayer, persistent text-based games, which can trace their origins back to 1975. They're played through Telnet or a dedicated MUD client, making them ideal to work on nearly any device without requiring any graphics cards or similar. If your device is connected to the internet, it's very likely you can play a MUD. And that brings us into our crates. Ever had your character jitter around when making the camera follow them? Is your game using Avian slightly choppy whenever something moves? Avian interpolation might be for you. If you use Avian physics and don't directly mutate any rigid body transforms manually, adding this plugin will automatically make your stuff smoother for you. Note that this was developed for the coming Avian release, and as such depends on Avian's main branch until then, which also means there's no crates.io release until then. This is very similar to a recent crate called Bevy Transform Interpolation, which if you're interested in the trade-offs between the two, there's a Differences to section in Avian Interpolation's README. Next up, we've got Unbug. Unbug provides programmatic breakpoint macros in a similar fashion to some of the asserts in Unreal Engine. The breakpoints do require nightly rust and as the core intrinsics feature as well. So keep that in mind if you go try to use this. And finally up for crates this week, Bevy Rusty Synth allows you to play MIDI files and sound fonts in your game. If you check out the demo in Discord, it has a little bit of scary monsters and nice sprites for you. And that's it for this week. As always, we have all the pull requests that were merged this week, as well as the issues and PRs that were opened this week. So if you want to get involved or look deeper into what's happening, definitely go check out those lists. And until then, I'll see you next week. Have a great rest of your week.